Hi, everybody. Good evening. It looks like we're just about um, all here. Amy had um, a matter that she needed to attend to, so she is um, hoping to join us a little late, but I will go ahead and get us um, kicked off. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know Salhegan has a meeting following this one, um, so I'd like to call the meeting to order at 5.01. And it looks like our first order of business on the agenda is the approval of the November 18th, 2020 meeting minutes. Uh, can I get a motion for those minutes? I'll motion to approve, Shannon. Great, thanks, Victoria. Is there any discussion? Great, can I have a second? Ellen seconds, great. All those in favor? Awesome, thanks guys. Okay, and next on the agenda, we have um, the school board updates. So we'll start with Amherst School Board. Um, Ellen or Tom? Yeah, Tom is um, making dinner and listening. So I will Great. chime in. Thank you. Um, so the school board had a discussion at our last meeting uh, around the potential issues that may come up if deliberative um, does not go down the way the bond uh, policy people think it should. Um, it was pretty much decided that we're going to move forward, continue to get information about how deliver deliberative is going to be rolled out. I made the point that regardless, um, our work as JFAC should continue on um, because even if, goodness forbid, we have a vote and it passes and the bond policy people um, who make these important decisions, say mm -mm -mm, you didn't cross your T's and dot your I's, um, then we would just revisit it in March of 2022 and um, it would pass then. So we're not gonna operate on fear, we're just gonna move forward. Great, any other updates um, that we should be aware of on the Amherst side or was that, that's probably it, right? It is it, yeah. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Pim and Stephanie, any updates? I know you guys have a meeting after this. Any other updates? Yeah, so um, I will leave the updates to those that are curious can tune in to our meeting this evening because mm -hmm. it's, it's all gonna be discussed at that point. Uh, there are several options, I think, on the floor. Um, I know, you know, Stephanie and uh, gave me the lowdown on, uh, on a few different ideas, um, and I support those ideas, and um, those have gone out to our board as well, so everyone's aware of it, and hopefully we'll have a um, speedy uh, discussion around it. Um, but there are, uh, like I said, the idea being that we come to a decision, or we have to come to a decision really today on it, so we can decide whether or not um, it's going to be a Warren article, part of the budget, or something else. Great. And I know that um, Victoria presented at your last meeting on behalf of the 2.0 subcommittee. Um, so uh, she's on our agenda to, to share an update there. So if there, I don't know if everyone on this committee was able to tune into that meeting. Would you like me to jump in now, Shannon? Yeah, I think that would make sense. I'm just going to kind of bump that up um in the agenda because i think that's relevant sure so um our sohegan 2.0 subcommittee presented at the um, sohegan cooperative school board meeting and the way that we presented to them was giving some options um, really understanding that that was our role was to give options and it's the school board's choice to determine the timing the scope and how to fund um, so each of the three projects were given three tiers a high, a medium, and a low. Um, that included the secure front, front entrance, the locker rooms, and the science labs. Um, our, our suggestions were 250 for the main entrance, 75 for the locker rooms, um, and then the understanding that the science labs really need some time to be looked at. And if the board is looking to do something immediately, then our suggestion was to work on one science lab in the annex. Um, that being said, the science labs in the annex and the science labs in the main building are all part of the scope 10 that we received from La Valley Brunzinger. Um, and giving 
the school and the administration just a little bit more time to figure that out um, is something that as a committee we've discussed, you know, would be a benefit if that's the direction that the um, school board wants to go. But again, it's up to them. Our job was just to roll out the options um, and, and we've answered any questions um, from the Sohegan Finance Advisory Committee that we've received um, and anything that was asked of us at the school board meeting has also been addressed. So that's where we stand. Great, and I watched that meeting. You guys did a really great job um, presenting those options. So we'll stay tuned tonight um, as the board discusses those options in further detail. Um, before we move forward, does anyone have questions regarding any of the school board updates um, that we just heard? Great, we're rolling right along. Um, let's see, our next item on the agenda, I'm going to uh, put a pin in at the moment because Amy and Roger are not here. Um, so we will move on to the PR subcommittee. We just met um, earlier this afternoon. Um, well, we've met several times since our last meeting. Um, our most recent was earlier this afternoon. We are in a phase of um, kind of starting weekly check-ins as we need to start presenting um, the information to the public um, and informing them um, regarding everything that, that will be on the ballot in March now that we know kind of the direction that Amherst is heading. Um, the website is almost ready for a soft launch. We received, as you all hopefully saw in Slack today, the executive summary and the full report um, PDF from Lance. So we'll be adding those um, to the site as well. And before we take that site live, we'll make sure to get the link to this group one more time for that last kind of uh, look through. And if there's anything you guys want us to have on there, we will. Um, and then Lance has also provided some updated um, kind of conceptual. So I'm going to ask him to take us through those in just a moment and um, and talk about those since we have those. That wasn't on the agenda. Um, that was kind of an, an add-in um, this afternoon. Um, in addition, as a PR subcommittee, we've kind of broken up into little groups within our subcommittee. Um, so we have some folks working on a speaker series, um, identifying topics and doing some pre-recorded um, Q&A that we can push out to the public um, through social media, on the website, uh, in a variety of ways. We're trying to find creative ways to um, talk and engage with folks during this time um, when some of our more traditional methods of uh, engaging with the community aren't as available to us. Um, we also have a, a couple of folks working on mailers and flyers and, and, and how can we spread the word that way. So, so we are active and we are working um, and we will, we will keep you guys all tuned into that. Um, does anyone have any questions um, regarding? Anything? Yes, Ellen. Yeah, or did I leave anything out more importantly? Um, so I have a question and maybe Adam, that we have you here, you can help me to answer this. So Jeannie and I are gonna be working on mailers and <clears throat> direct household information through snail mail. Is there any funding or how can we raise funds or do we have money or how do we do that? So <clears throat> we have to be uh, extremely careful not to use uh, tax dollars for um, uh, things that are trying to influence voters. So we can be very factual and tell them uh, facts if we use tax dollars, but in general, it's the, the best idea to, is to use some other source of funding to do mailers or advertisements, um, especially if you're trying to convince people about why they should vote for or against something. I'm sorry, Ellen. I just, I wanna be clear too, when I'm referring to the website that we're working on, the website is being built by a volunteer in town, um, graciously, generously donating um, his time and, and expertise. So that is um, that is a great way to get the message out, not not using any, any taxpayer dollars, so. So Adam, what would you suggest? Can we reach out to the PTA? Can we get private donations? Yes, yes. and yes. All, all of those things. So okay. um, if uh, if the PTA wanted to, wanted to do a, an advertisement, they certainly could on their own. <clears throat> if some private individual wanted to send something to other people's homes, they could do that as well. Okay, but it, if it comes from the JCAP, JFAC committee, well, the JFAC committee is a subcommittee of the SAU board. Right. And so the JFAC subcommittee cannot be taking a position that way um, 
representatives of the JFAC committee can though. So um, uh, John Bowkett can write a letter uh, that can be quoted and he can be listed as a member of the JFAC. Uh, it, that sort of thing is permissible, but um, the JFAC as a subcommittee shouldn't be uh, taking a, a political stand on whether an issue should be voted for or against. I know it seems kind of ironic because this committee is deciding on what they think ought to be passed and the reasons why, but it's really about the use of tax dollars um, to convince voters in, in avoiding electioneering. Sure, so if it's informational and not um, political um, or doesn't have a sway or one way or the other, we can accept donations to put together flyers to share our work? Um, it's best if the JFAC doesn't do it directly. It's best if members of the JFAC do it or the PR subcommittee does it, but they're, okay. they're not, there's no official vote of the JFAC to support it. Think okay. about the uh, the voters guide every year. The voters guide, we're very careful to say, here is the budget, here are the things included in it, here is why we've, in, but we, we don't say, you really ought to vote for the budget because it's going to lead to X, Y, or Z. So we don't do the, we, we, we tow that line with the voters guide. That's another good example of how we do that. JFAC provided something like that. Could it go out in the voters guide? Absolutely, I think so. Okay. Yeah. I have some examples of what other school districts have done from private citizens versus from groups like this. Um, I can share those and post them onto Slack from another community. Um, yes, please. See that, that would be great, Lance. Thank one, you. One flyer does say vote and here are the benefits and the other flyer says vote yes. Um, and you can tell which one was funded by who. Okay. Lisa. Shannon, just real quick, if you um, if the PR committee decides to do a webinar, the sooner um, you all can contact DPW or someone contacts DPW, the, you can see if you can get onto their cycle of using the great big blinking signs like out on Boston Post Road. Oh, cool. Um, great, even, yeah. their, even their sign board at the transfer station, they can put up a notice about something. So that is one way to access a lot of people. That's that's really great tip. Thank you, Lisa. And just the main the main DPW number is who you would call for that. Yeah, yeah. You'll talk to Pat Delisle at the DPW. So, so my question, um, I didn't mean to interrupt, but um, if we do signage, you know, like yard signs, um, do we have to raise funds uh, privately for that? I would assume. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Meaning that we can't get the PTA or the PTSA to um, fund something like that. No, that is different. That's considered private funding. There's, there's no, you know, the the school district. So, for example, every year the school and her school board doesn't buy signs that says "vote yes to our budget," right? Because that's taxpayer money. Last year, the PTA voted, and their membership chose to support signs asking and supporting the Amherst School District budget. So, th so that's that's acceptable. Um, so I say, I would say, you know, it's it's okay to inform community groups of what we're doing and what our recommendation is. And then if those groups choose to support that and choose to buy signage, then then they that can happen. Is that, am I missing is that? Yeah. Does that answer your question, Jeannie? Yeah, I just um, wondered if we ought to, um, you know, when we got, you know, the annex passed and the um, and the renovations to the middle school, there was a group outside called Amherst Citizens Support Our Schools. Mm -hmm. Do do we need to create that? Because that's what I was thinking we were doing, but maybe maybe we're not supposed to be uh, so, doing that. So the way that you know, I think that we're sort of the um, we're the group who was tasked with doing the comprehensive, you know analysis and looking and making the recommendation and we've done that so now i think it's fair that we tap into those groups and say um and i think that some of those groups exist um and and i think some of us on the call are, are part of a variety of those groups who would be inclined to su support something like this but um those groups would have to, to do that separately but having the information and the, the factual pieces that led us to this recommendation we absolutely should share that we just can't, as a subcommittee of the SAU, um, 
have any language around it that says, you know, vote yes, vote yes. We can say, go vote, and here's why we have recommended this. It, it, it's a nuance. It's very, like, I feel like it's a very kind of fine, fine line, but it's, um, I mean, I, I get it from a, from a perspective of um, representing um, everyone in, in, in town and the, and the taxpayer dollars that go along with it. But it's okay for us to educate them about the project and yes. answer questions, correct? Okay. Yep. And it's okay individually, um, you know, for, for, for me to send an email to, you know, my 25 friends, I'm not even gonna say I have 100 because 25, my 25 friends, right? And say, you know, oh yes, I support this and here's why. I can do that as just me, myself. I cannot do that as a representative of this, you know, I can't say the whole committee or the SAU says you should do this. I can say, I support this, I believe in this, and here's what I know about it. Um, is that correct, um, Adam? That's, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, it's a good question. Okay. Question for Lance, if it's okay. It's related sure. to the bond. Lance, have you um, ever run across an issue with a town that has voted in a project and then has had issues um, with the bond? What is it called, Adam? The bond board? The bond people? Council. The bond council. Um, okay. Turning down the request for the bond? I have not experienced that. I've been a part of several bond votes, but I've never seen that happen. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question, Ellen. I did have a question as well regarding bond council um, when it came up this week because it's not something that we've spent any time discussing in this group. Um, so maybe Adam, if you could just, I know it's not on the agenda and I hate to put you on the spot, but if you could just give us like a five minute rundown on when that happens in the process and, and what that involves. Sure, so uh, municipal bonds uh, are uh, highly regulated. Um, they're regulated by the uh, SEC and uh, and other, I'm not an expert, but other other agencies as well. And the uh, the benefit of municipal bonds, of course, is that they're tax free and that the earnings that uh, that uh, are made are tax free. And so that that's what makes them um, uh, uh, appealing to people who want to buy them is is that tax free status. Um, and so the the sale of the bonds on a highly regulated market, they're sold on a, on a um, on Wall Street on a municipal bond. Uh, uh, trading market. Um, for that process to happen, there are several legal protections that have to be put in place to make sure um, that uh, the bonds are bona fide and are, and are uh, meant for the purpose described and all of that. The way that process works is it hinges on uh, a lawyer who specializes in the sale of bonds, um, who we typically call our bond counsel. Um, it hinges on their opinion of our process leading up to the sale of the bonds. And so bond council uh, has been engaged with us for several months already. Um, once we have a, the first whisper that there's a potential bond sale, we reach out to bond council and let them know what we're thinking and they give us a checklist. And uh, Michelle has right now uh, a list that it's a, it's a very intense spreadsheet that details um, how we post the notice of the bond hearing uh, does it go in the newspaper and, and, and copies of that and exactly what was said in that newspaper uh, notice about the, the bond hearing. Um, and there's a list of, of just maybe, I don't know, 50 or 100 things that we have to document along the way to show that we followed the process that's laid out in RSA 33, which is a municipal finance law, um, to a T. Because any if we don't do that, then bond council can't write a clean opinion um, about our process and we can't sell bonds in the regulated market. So um, that's why we engage bond council right from the start to make sure that we do everything along the way uh, safely to do that. The, uh, the question that's being raised this year is um, I would expect in, in uh, Lance's career, which he's got another 30 or 40 years left in his career, um, that he would never have an issue with bond council because um, 99.9% .9 of the time, bond counsel is something no one even knows is there. They do their job, they write their opinion, and uh, fade into the woodwork. Um, the reason there's a question this year is 
with potential changes to deliberative session and the cha potential changes to the public hearing, which will also be a bond hearing for Amherst, there's a, a concern about whether the change to the process will be met with scrutiny from people involved in the bond trading uh, process. Um, and because it's an unprecedented thing, it makes bond councils, uh, but lawyers who do bond work, uh, which are notoriously extremely conservative, nervous, which thus in turn makes me nervous. So that's, that's, uh, that's why this has been, become a topic this year because of the pandemic and how it might affect both our bond hearing and deliberative session. Thanks for that explanation. I'm curious if you, um, in your work with the bond council or, or just with your, you know, um, cohorts uh, it, in the superintendent world, are you aware of any other bonds in the state right now? Um, you know, who, who would kind of be doing the same thing we're doing or, or something? That's a great question. I'm actually not aware. I've not heard of anyone else being during this time projects right now. I think Hudson is considering a bond and they have that on their next school board agenda. Thanks, Lance. And right because now the, the public hearing is slated to be on Zoom. I'm sorry, Stephen. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. I was just gonna ask if the size of the bond because we're looking at a fairly you know large amount. Is that gonna cause any other concerns versus if we were only asking for like 40 million? No, the, the, the size, the only difference the size makes is for smaller bonds, uh, most municipalities use, use the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank to sell the bonds um, on their behalf. Um, they, the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank is a, a small organization. I think they have three employees, but they gather a municipal bond offerings from, from every municipality, some that are bonding you know, a $300,000 ambulance or something. They collect all those and a couple of times a year, they sell them as a larger offering on the bond market so that uh, smaller bonds have a chance to get sold. For larger projects, most people sell them themselves or sell directly and hire a, um, a fiduciary um, financial advisor and a broker uh, that works on our behalf to sell the bonds. But that, that's usually the only difference. Right now, the public hearing is scheduled to take, is that still, in, in question, I know the deliberative session is in question, um, but public hearings, are those still up in the air or has that been determined? Yes, so that's that's still up in the air. There's another meeting tomorrow with the moderators uh, to discuss. Um, what's unique is um, every bond offering has to have a bond hearing as well, which a bond hearing usually takes place at the same time as a, as a public hearing for a budget. They're usually one in the same uh, meeting. But again, given um, the predicament that we're in, it's possible that because Amherst is offering a bond, they might be required to hold an in-person uh, bond hearing, uh, again, to avoid the potential for bond council writing an unclean opinion um, about the, the process. Does anyone else have any other questions for Adam around this issue? Hi, sorry for joining late, guys. I thought it was going to be a bad Christmas at the Facey household with putting our dog down, but it's not happening. So, yeah, <laughs> lots of drugs. <laughs> oh, that's tough. Sorry, Amy. We're glad you're here. So, Amy, on our agenda, we are basically um, pretty much mostly through the agenda. Um, we have uh, the project plan and timeline from you and Roger. And then if there was time, Lance was going to pull up his updated conceptuals and kind of talk around that um, if we have time. Okay, if great. And Roger, want to want to take it from there. I think we're, we've moved through um, everything else. So so you have, have not gone through the spreadsheet that Roger put together. Is that right? Okay, great. Yeah. So um, at our last board meeting, we had some conversations around trying to get everything so he can um, in terms of capital improvements and maintenance all into one document. So Roger did a fantastic job of pulling all of that together. Um, we put it out to a few folks and got some feedback. So there's been a few tweaks, but it's really helpful, I think, for us, for the advisory finance committee, for the board to have all this information in one place to be able to um, 
to you know sort of understand the full landscape and then be able to um and for the board to be able to make some funding decisions hopefully later tonight so um roger do you have that do you are you able to share your screen yeah i i can take it to, from, from here thank you great thank you and he did this very quickly for for me as well so really appreciate it so can everybody see my screen? You're seeing a 10 year project plan. Yep. It's tiny, but we can see it. So you, you may have to narrate a little bit for those of us who, who don't have our glasses handy. I'm just gonna How's say, that? Shannon, you're a lot younger than me too. I definitely <laughs> can't see it. <laughs> Is that a little bit better? Yeah, that's better. Awesome. So. On the top row here, we're just we're 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 pulling in the operating budget. It's our FY21 budget that we're currently working off of now, and it's our proposed FY22 budget. And as the years goes on, we can enter those amounts, the proposed amounts, and the actuals as as we move forward. Um, there is a note in here that we did add the seventy-five thousand for the locker replacement um, that was proposed in the priority projects for Sauhegan 2.0. So that is in the operating budget for FY22 proposed. Um, lines rows five and six here, we're looking at the turf field replacement. Turf field was installed in November of 2016 and it has um, an anticipated life cycle of 10 to 12 years. I reached out to the people that actually installed the field for um, a number and that's where we got the 340,000. They're giving us about um, $4 per square foot for replacement on that. The turf field is about 85,000 square feet. Um, not only comfortable with one number, I reached out to a second vendor and that's where we came in for an anticipated five years. That 550 is actually proposed for five years out. There is some savings in the plan that I shared with the Sauhegan um, facilities update that says that um, we can save some of our infill and there's also a cost for, um, there's about $50,000 for removal of the existing turf. It's a really good line item quote to just see where where all of those items and the the um, for the replacement really play out. Um, the next lines are really the priority capital projects that um, Victoria presented that we've pulled out of Sauhegan 2.0. It's the renovation to the secure main entrance for 250,000. I kept the line item for the lockers in here, but we added them into the operating budget above. And then the science lab we're proposing for 425,000 for one lab. Down at the bottom, there's just a note here for the two remaining labs for 750,000 or 850,000. There's that variance there because Lance gave us pricing for doing two labs at the same time was 750. But if we decided to do one lab at a time, that would be 425 a piece and kind of how we get the, the 850 number there. As we go down through the next rows here, um, we got some really good feedback and that's where we add, added the, just the contribution line to what we were adding each year, that starting balance. And then we go through the projects for the year, what those projects total, and then it gives us an ending balance for the expendable trust. This is a working document here as far as to move these around if we needed to, but this is really the onsite insight report, how this was proposed and laid out for the, the years to come. Um, to the right, I just added a column, just the, the total contributions for the 10 years. And then at the bottom on the right, it's the total projects proposed here. You can see at FY30, we have about 757,000 um, for, for an ending balance. And then we just didn't want to lose track of 2.0 for the years to come. And then these were the entire projects still to be reviewed by administration and tweaked a little. Um, there are still portions in here as far as the, the main entrance. Um, we still call that out because um, it is the administration area and the special services area that we would not be touching with the proposed um, 250 up here. And then as we move down the same thing with, although we're um, proposing to install lockers, we're still looking at a locker room renovation and as far as adding team rooms. Um, so this document really pulls everything together. Um, I hope it's very useful. I, I, I really like the way that it worked out at, at first. I really 
really looking at this, I didn't know how to put it together, but at the end result, I think it's um, really what everybody was looking for. So I, I also appreciate Michelle's time and, and everybody's feedback to, to get us to where we are with this document here. Yeah, thank you, Roger. And I'll just add on, on 2.0, um, we have had discussions that we want to uh, make sure we give Mike uh, very sufficient time to really dig in and make sure that you know what we want to do in 2.0 aligns with um, the strategic vision um, for the school. So, any any questions for um, Roger? And and yeah, also thank you, Michelle, for for starting the process um, on this. I think it it's helpful, but. Any questions from folks? Yeah, Victoria. I think the, the document looks great. I think it's a really nice way to be able to see the different um, information that we've received from different sources. Um, one thing that I just, I wanna just say it somewhere publicly, um, I think Sohegan 2.0, the $35 million project is a large ask. And a lot of it seems like it's high, you know, pie in the sky and um, maybe took on a little bit of a life of its own. Um, not that those things are not wonderful um, to have in our school, but I, I do think that when the board is, is making decisions moving forward, having that, that thought of spending the $35 million on all of that um, is, is probably much higher than needs to be. So I just want to make sure that that, that opinion is, has been shared. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think um, you know that's certainly partly why we want to have Mike Barry really dig in and um, and take a look and hopefully refine and uh, reduce where possible um, and just make sure that those are actually the projects that at this point in time um, and under the conditions that we're in are um, what the board should be going forward with. So definitely more work to be done there. Any other questions or comments? Right. Well, yeah, hopefully it's, um, it'll be useful. I think it'll be helpful for our board meeting, which is happening in a half an hour. So. <laughs> Great. No, that, that was a super update. Thank you. Um, I agree with Victoria. I really like how that was laid out, Roger. That's really helpful. Um, I'm wondering if we can maybe spend just a few minutes since we have the time here together tonight with uh, Lance kind of sharing the um, updated drawings and just talking to us a little bit, Lance, I know there's been some questions in this committee before as to, well, when can we start really digging into those designs? And I know that there's there's kind of a timing, you know, pre-bond, post-bond, how that looks. So if you could give us the, remind us again um, of the sequence of, of how that plays out and, and what you have for us to look at tonight. Sure. So um, the important thing to know is that pre-bond, we are in what we would call a conceptual phase. We're at a place where we believe we have the right size of the project, um, that we have the right dollar figure, um, and we're ready to be able to inform taxpayers about generally what we're going to build, um, generally what it's going to look like, and then exactly what the costs are going to be, um, the cost or you know the the cap that we're setting. Um, if when you go to bond, after you go to bond, you will have about a nine month process of design of further design and engineering um, and refinement starts with schematic design. Um, the intent is to continue follow through. We don't want to be disingenuous with voters as in, you know, we're going to build a new elementary school for X number of students. We're still going to stay with that, but we're going to continue to refine it. Um, we're going to look at codes um, and we're going to take a lot of input from uh, groups like this. Typically there will be a building committee informing us, input from school boards and then input from educators. So we do another round of um, teacher um, workshops where we would go through space by space with educators and really refine them to make sure they're the right size and they're the right, they're properly equipped. Um, if you look at other communities phases from conceptual design all the way to construction documents, you'll see um, the same concept as in where it's going to be built and how big the building is, but you'll see it's quite a bit different in terms of how those lamp rooms lay out. Um, and that's something that, that there, for us, the design stays flexible right up until bid day. On bid day, we try to not make changes because changes cost more money. Um, so as long as we have the time and we will 
to get enough input, we'll get this project right. Uh, but there's a lot of decisions to be made. What we've made so far for decisions are the general scope of the project and the dollar figure. Those are the two things that we have to be key, um, stay consistent with. But just the same with that, I'll, I, we have updated some of our concepts um, based on input we've had from this group and based on the decisions we made. So as many of you recall, we came out with a set of designs um, and drawings. We had the construction estimator price those up. We worked with a group of you to refine the costs and we just now updated those. Um, we also took some feedback from this group talking about the general massing, uh, particularly at Clark Wilkins. So I'm gonna share my screen. And on those refined costs, I just want to, um, so we're looking at 66 million for a new elementary school and 31.6 for the renovation at AMS, bringing us to a like new facility there. Is that correct? Am I, am I correct on those numbers? Yes, that's what I have in the, in the executive summary. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So assuming everybody can share my screen, um, see my screen. So Based on some of the, the discussions we've had, I know we talked a fair amount about how much skylights, how much glass would be appropriate for the building, um, which rooms needed to be 1,000 square feet versus 900. And we've been working on the floor plan to update that. At the same time, um, our first pass at massing, just trying to size the building, um, many people noted that doesn't look like it's got the character of Amherst in it at this point. And although we, like I said, there's a lot of work to refine it when we're done in terms of exterior materials, roof slopes, um, and really trying to break that character down and make sure that when we're done, this building feels like it was designed just for Amherst. Um, we did want to take at least one more pass at it here and say conceptually, we're, we're starting to say we should break this down. So overall, you see the plan is strikingly similar to the site plan. We think the site plan worked very well. But we did start looking at how the materials work out. Now that group that we worked with did start to say, geez, we're gonna have some brick um, and we're also gonna have some concrete masonry units um, and kind of mix some of those in because they're cost effective and they're still durable. Um, they are consistent with many of your other buildings. You actually have large scale brick at your middle school. It's called jumbo brick. Um, and you have some concrete masonry throughout many of your buildings. Um, but what we've tried to do is say, well, we started to suggest where would those changes be, um, where you have some banding down low and some brick elements up high, um, and then also trying to break the scale down because we felt, um, based on feedback from the committee, that this, you know, it was a three-story building at the back, two-story at the front, and that we didn't want it to feel like it, you know, feel too large for the size of the kids that are entering. So um, we did start working on trying to get a little bit more of a residential scale there and trying to make it a little bit more inviting. Um, and again, consistent with some of the community buildings you have in town with different sloped roofs throughout your community and the scale of those buildings, kind of the, the downtown scale. For the exterior, we did start to say, well, there was definitely some opportunity and again, not the final design, but we think there's opportunity to have a little bit of playful color, um, both inside and outside. And we wanted to start to suggest that on some of these renderings. Um, so you can see we've got some, some exterior artwork, we've got some colors, um, and again, just working really hard to break that down. Now, one of the one of the cost savings measures we did was taking some of this glass where we had large panes of glass and kind of being a little more concise with where that glass goes, um, as well as trying to say, you know, like we had a very large bus drop canopy for a while there. And we said, geez, you know, we'd, we'd like to reduce the cost on that. So you can see a more modest bus drop canopy enough so that you can be um, out of the rain as you're coming and going from a bus or a parent pickup, but that not the entire site is a large bus drop area. So we have, at the same time as we're working that massing, um, work to refine the floor plan. Um, you can see that we actually mirrored this building. At one time we had the kindergarten on this side and we had the first grade on this side. And that's just to break the scale down on the side that's most visible. Um, remember that this side of the building um, actually backs up to the field. So there's a little less of a view of that side of the building. So we said we want the bump out to be on this side of the building. Um, and then really started working through some of the egress um, for the different areas um, and refining where the doors are. Um, we also did, um, I think, Roger, you remember that we, we looked at interior glass and how much glass we should have. So this revised concept pulled back on some of that interior glass um, and it does improve our acoustics. Um, it's just a little bit of a design change there and kind of tighten these areas up a little bit. So that's really where we're at now. Um, it is still, for many people, um, it's strikingly similar, um, but I'm interested in feedback from the group if they think this is generally the scale and the um, the right approach to this building. 
Yes, I think it is. <laughs> um, I, I like the front, how it, um, it actually kind of mimics a bit of the brick school, um, you know, in the triangle at the center and how that's a little bit larger. Um, so I think it's definitely on the right track to what we were asking for. So thank you for, for taking another pass. I know it's um, a process for the design, but thank you for making us feel a yep. little bit more at ease. Lance, um, in our estimate, is the vegetation that we see included? So the trees that obviously would be new, is that all included as well? Yeah, we included an allowance for landscaping. I will say that as designers, we show mature trees and it may be that the first couple of years, those trees are smaller. Um, I don't think it's, it, it's rarely a wise investment of taxpayer funds to buy a mature tree when you can, when you're building a school that's gonna last outlast all of us. Agreed. So okay. they are, I will say the renderings, we like to show mature trees in our renderings, but the first few years, they're not going to be quite that big. Okay. Hey, Lance, I, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Roger. I saw Jeannie's hand. Um, yeah, I, I think it looks great. Uh, I, I love the fact that it ha does have a more residential um, in keeping with, uh, you know, the village of Amherst. My, my concern, and this question has been asked before I assume, and maybe I just haven't heard the answer. Are we really going to have kids walking up three floors, little kids? Yeah, the we put the oldest kids on the top floors. We have our fourth grade in um, um, fourth and fifth grade up there. So, in our experience, the three stories is not uncommon in New Hampshire for schools. I think if you look at many schools, like many of Rochester's schools, you'll see three story designs um, throughout. The other nice thing about three stories from a building standpoint is it's much more sustainable than two story construction because it's got less exterior envelope. Um, so we consider it very sustainable and, and it's better on energy costs if we can go three story versus two story. Okay, and you don't see that as a, as a problem for little kids then? At... I haven't seen it. We do have, we do have an elevator in the building um, to meet accessibility requirements, but I mean, you're talking about, you know, we entered the first floor up two floors. Okay. It'll be in great so, shape, Jeannie. I, yeah, I guess. So yeah, just want to um, let everyone know that the Sohegan folks are going to have to sign off. We have a non-public at 545. Um, so just wanted to give a heads up. The rest of you are, well, maybe you're not welcome to stay because it's Adam's meeting, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Why don't we wrap it up, Roger? Can we, we'll, we'll kind of end with you. You had a question. No, I just, I, I really like what Lance did with the, the rendering and taking our feedback. I, I really like the front there. I feel that's very inviting. Um, but, but Ellen's question just kind of rang a bell for me is, any Lance, Lance, can we do a rendering? And I know we're not there yet, but just with an idea, idea of what it's gonna look like with rooftop units. I mean, maybe that front, if, if, if those are gymnasiums, they might need just a windscreen or something like that. I just want to be open yep. about what, how, we're, how we're seeing this, yeah. this building. I understand. It's a, it's a common thing right now. Obviously, we don't have mechanical units located. Um, what we'll, we'll likely do is work very hard um, to locate our mechanical units um, where they won't impact you from the ground. So I'm looking at mechanical units that I really want to start putting them here and here but avoid having them up here so that when you're, um, when you're on the ground that you're not seeing, um, you're not seeing them. Right, agreed. But just, I, I, I really like what you did with it. Good job. Great, thank you. Lance, this is John. Yes. On the three-story section of the building, I think you and I talked about it earlier. Have you been able to take any water test on where the uh, water table is on the back yet? We have not. Um, that is something that we did. We put in the budget for post bond. Um, essentially, we just don't have the money pre bond to spend on the survey and the geotechnical report. So it's something we'll have to do post bond. Um, I'm, you know, worst case scenario, we would have to raise the grade by a foot or something like that around the building. Um, but it's a significant enough building that that it should be easy to grade out. 
I was just hoping we could get down four feet to reduce the height. That's where I was coming. Oh from. yes, yeah. I, I think John, I think that's a, another excellent point. If we yes. if we go down, not necessarily four feet, but two feet or so, so we get the window sills at the, <laughs> yes. you know, because we're talking about kindergarten kids, who so our window sills tend to be about two feet, so they can see out well. Um, but we we definitely have the ability to recess the recess it about two feet into the grade there, um, depending on the water table. Um, one thing that's not evident on these renderings is, um, as you, if you've been to the site, this hill is significantly larger and that hill will be above kind of which does nestle into the site and makes the building feel a little smaller. But excellent point, John. Thanks for the question, John. All right, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, I believe we, st we still have meetings on the books, right? We do. So I think we're good. Um, I'm assuming you guys talked about PR subcommittee and all that. Everyone's all set? Yep. We're okay. good. All right. Thank you, everybody. Happy Have holidays, holiday. guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.